This podcast is brought to you by the Creation Academy Honors Program, an apologetics learning experience designed to teach, train, and inspire others to become strong defenders of the Christian faith and biblical creation. Launching early 2019, the program offers video and audio training with downloadable course workbooks, expert interviews, and exclusive Q&A sessions with leading creation scientists and apologists, quarterly ebooks covering a wide variety of subject matter, and even a private Facebook community where you'll fellowship and interact with a like-minded community of believers. If you want to be notified when the program goes live and even help us design the experience from the ground up, head on over to www.jointca.co today and sign up for the wait list. You'll get early access to the private Facebook group for free as a thank you for joining. You're listening to the Steve Schramm Show, a weekly podcast defending the truth of God's Word in apologetics and biblical creation science. I hope you are doing well today. Today's topic, we're going to be discussing um, another question that I received uh, pretty recently, actually very recently. And so I want to discuss the difference between uniformitarianism and the uniformity of nature. These are two completely uh, different things, but they sound so very similar. And uh, to be honest with you, they have concepts within them that are very similar. And so I think we need to uh, be sure that we don't confuse one for the other and also know how to draw the distinction um, when we are conversing with somebody who doesn't, uh, doesn't see it at first blush. Now, uh, before we dive into that, let me uh, just do a few things, or at least one thing by way of housekeeping. I want to say thank you to those of you who have uh, rated and reviewed the show. Uh, wherever you listen to the show, um, uh, whether it be Google Play Store or somewhere through the Apple Podcasts uh, directory, we would certainly appreciate if you uh, enjoy what we're doing here, if you find the show to have useful and helpful information, we would encourage you to go there and uh, give us a five-star review. Um, go ahead and uh, and actually uh, leave a comment there, uh, a comment review, and uh, just say that uh, you know we're, we're thankful for this show and the insight that uh, that Steve brings to these issues, or just whatever you want to say. Um, we appreciate an honest review there, uh, for good or for bad. But uh, of course, those good reviews certainly do help us to get seen by other people. So. Um, if you believe in what we're doing here and you want to uh, help spread that message to other people, believe it or not, one of the very best ways that you can do that is simply by uh, reviewing our show in iTunes and the Google Play Store. So, um, or sh- I guess I should say now Apple Podcasts, uh, since they changed that, and the Google Play Store. So we certainly appreciate uh, your commitment to do that. Okay, so let's talk about uniformitarianism, and the uniformity of nature. Last week when we uh, discussed our topic, I referenced an article that I had written a few weeks earlier for the Creation Club. And what's a little bit ironic is that this week's topic uh, unintentionally also has to do with uh, a topic that I just wrote about for the Creation Club. And um, had I been prepared, I would uh, have that link pulled up already. So I'm going to go ahead and go to it um, live here and uh, see if I can pull it up. And while while I'm doing that, we will um, continue the discussion. So talking about uniformity and the uniformity of nature, uh, I recently wrote in the Creation Club, um, and I asked a question in there. I said, should we trust scientists? Should we trust scientists? Should Christians trust scientists um, more uh, precisely? And it's kind of an interesting question 
because, I mean, I think, of course, Christians uh, can trust scientists. Uh, there, in fact, are some scientists who contribute to the Creation Club blog, to the very audience that I was writing to. Um, but what we need to be careful of is that there is this uh, stigma that Christians distrust actual science in favor of creation science. And what I wanted to argue in the article was that scientific skepticism isn't really the issue at all. It's actually philosophical skepticism. Let me, let me try that again. It's actually philosophical skepticism, okay? It's not scientific uh, skepticism. It's philosophical skepticism. Now, the Bible uh, warns us, the Apostle Paul specifically, warns us not to be cap taken captive by uh, the philosophies of man and uh, vain deceit, you know, anything that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And what we find is that there are some philosophical systems that undergird even the processes of, of what is supposed to be um, neutral, rationalistic science that will, in fact, determine uh, the outcome of the results. And I wanted to take that question a little further in the article that I wrote for the Creation Club, and I wanted to say, okay, well, let's look at some common definitions of science, and I wanted to go through and say, look, is, is, is this definition of science something that creationists reject, and so on and so forth. And I went through every Webster's definition of science and showed how, based on the dictionary definition of science, uh, it is not science that creationists disagree with. And so I think that I argued pretty convincingly for that. And by the way, the article, um, if you go to thecreationclub.com, it's, uh, it's there, uh, thecreationclub.com slash should-christians-trust-scientists. That's how you could find this article. So we asked the question, what is science? And we went through those definitions. And so it appears that creationists don't distrust scientists um, or science uh, proper. And so I moved to the next question. The next question I asked was, okay, well, if that's not the case, well, then when, when people approach science, what assumptions are in play? In other words, what is it actually that creationists reject? And I argued in the article that uh, undergirding almost all of the project of uh, secular science is two assumptions. The first one is philosophical naturalism, and the second one is uniformitarianism. And so I'm not going to uh, go down the rabbit trail of philosophical uh, uh, naturalism today. We've actually talked about that in a previous podcast lesson uh, on uh, dealing with the definition of science. Actually, what is science? Um, what on earth is science? I think is the title of that episode if you want to go try to find it at some point. Uh, but I do want to deal with the issue of uniformitarianism a little bit and talk about it. Now, what I asked in the Creation Club article of these two assumptions, philosophical naturalism and uniformitarianism, is two questions then. I said, all right, are these necessary, number one, and number two, are they warranted? Are they necessary and are they warranted? Now, as we go through this lesson, what we're going to do in, in a detail that I did not do in the article is answer that with very, uh, hopefully with pretty, pretty specific regards to uh, the project of uniformitarianism. And I want to kind of zoom out now that we have that background and ask a couple larger questions and make a couple larger statements. Now, undergirding all of science is something called the uniformity of nature. The uniformity of nature. Now, what is that? 
Well, I'm going to give you a definition according to Dr. Jason Lyle. He is a creationist, uh, uh, astrophysicist. He's uh, also, I think, uh, quite the theologian. I think he's written some really good books uh, arguing from theological perspectives. And uh, also, he's a skilled logician as well. I mean, the guy really, really, uh, I think, knows his stuff. And so according to Lyle, now he says this, in order to do science, we take for granted that the universe is understandable that it can be quantified in a way the mind can comprehend. We assume that the universe is logical and orderly, and that it obeys mathematical laws that are consistent over time and space. Even though conditions in different regions of space and eras of time are quite diverse, there is nonetheless an underlying uniformity. Because there is such regularity in the universe, there are many instances where scientists are able to make successful predictions about the future. And that's the end of that quote. So what he has described for us is is more precisely what is meant by the uniformity of nature. There are consistent uh, laws that... Uh, are consistent over time and space. Uh, There is regularity in the universe. Uh, Again, I've used this before, but one example I like to use to to kind of illustrate the uniformity of nature is that when you wake up tomorrow morning, you are not going to expect uh, a lion to be chilling in the living room while you make your morning coffee to have just appeared there, okay? Because things tend to happen consistently. Things uh, tomorrow are as they are today. Things today are as they were yesterday and the day before that, etc. So this is uniformity of nature. And we do expect nature to be uniform. We have a God who is omnipresent. He is uh, omnipotent. All right. He's omniscient. He, 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 uh, he transcends time in space. He's consistent. Colossians says he holds all things together. So we have a God who upholds this universe. Now there, I don't want to get too deep into uh, philosophy here, but you know, in days gone by, there were those philosophers who speculated that uh, literally every single individual atom in the entire universe Uh, was believed to be held in place specifically by God, and that God was literally interacting in everything. Now, there are some philosophical issues that have to do with that, okay? You know, does that make God the author of evil, etc.? I don't necessarily hold that view, but what what I'm trying to get to you here is that um, God is in control of this universe. He has power over this universe universe. In order for somebody to create a universe, uh, they must, uh, the the universe is everything that we know in terms of uh, power. So if you're going to create a universe, you must literally have all power because you would have power above every other amount of power that we know about. Okay, so not using scientifically precise terms there. But the point that I'm trying to get across is that God is uh, all powerful. He holds it all together. Without God, for whatever reason, however, whatever mechanism he uses to hold this thing together, if God were to stop doing that, this universe, this world would cease to exist. And so what I think we can take from this is that we have reason to believe that nature is uniform. Now this particular argument goes to the transcendental argument for God's existence. This is something that presuppositional apologists often use to try to show that features of our world that are inescapable, such as logic, science, and morality, for example, Uh, are impossible on atheistic views. And so the argument there essentially goes that uh, the only way that one could disprove God exists is by using things like logic and science and uh, possibly morality. These are things that depend on the existence of God. You are sawing off the branch 
that you're sitting on in that case. So this is a transcendental uh, type of argument. And I like this. This is the, the kind of argumentation uh, I tend to uh, I tend to use, uh, albeit maybe not in the, the way that sometimes it's popularized, okay? Uh, I, I do use evidence in my discussion with uh, non-believers, and we will probably say that complete topic for another day, uh, but I do everything in the context of a presuppositional apologetic, and if you're interested on my take on that, I have written on that on my website. It's one of the more popular articles. You can find it on the sidebar if you go there and uh, and read about my commitment to that apologetic. But nevertheless, uh, I think everybody, no matter what form of apologetics you want to use, I think everybody agrees here that God is responsible for the uniformity in nature. As a matter of fact, a popular evidentialist uh, apologist named Frank Turek wrote a book on this not too long ago called Stealing from God. And he does make the case that things like logic, science, morality, um, these things depend on there being a transcendent, omnipotent creator God. And so that is what the uniformity of nature is. We understand that this world is held together consistently in such a fashion that we can even do the kinds of scientific tests that allow us to use the scientific method over and over again and come to the same result every time. And that's how we know that something is, you know, scientifically tenable. Okay. Now, um, that is the uniformity of nature. Science depends on this. Don't miss that point. Science does not work without the uniformity of nature. Now, the question is, what about uniformitarianism? What is that? How is it different? Here's the thing. Science does not depend on a uniformitarianist philosophy though a commitment to it is pervasive in the sciences. Okay, it does not depend on a uniformitarianist philosophy, though a commitment to it is pervasive in the scientists, in the sciences. Okay, so, um, uniformitarianism is the belief that rates, processes, and conditions are the same today as they have ever been at any time in the past. Okay. Rates, conditions, and processes. Uh, and uniformitarianism proper uh, is um, a geology term. Okay, so when we're talking about it from a more technical perspective, think in terms of geology, but then realize that this the, the underlying tenets of this view is extrapolated into biology, astronomy. I mean, it's pervasive in the sciences, but it's a geological term because that's where it started. And uh, we don't have time to go over the history of that with uh, uh, Charles Lyell and um, and those guys, okay, who invented this thing, who, who, who popularized it. All right. Uh, but you can go back to our lesson on is uh, young age creationism pseudoscience. We had a two part lesson on that, and you can go back to those. And we talked about that a little bit during those two lessons. Okay, so uniformitarianism is a geology term, and it says that present rates, conditions, and processes, the ones that we observe today, are consistent all throughout time. And it's this underlying philosophy that uh, leads scientists to conclude that there was no such thing as a global flood. Uh, there was no such thing as a supernatural creation event, etc. These kinds of things simply do not play in that view. They, they don't work. And so, when somebody says there is no evidence for flood geology, I submit to you that the only way you can come up with such an assessment is to use a uniformitarianist philosophy and to disregard other forms of evidence, namely history. Okay? Now, is uniformitarianism a necessary assumption 
for science? This is a tricky question. I, no, I mean, the answer to it is no. The answer to it is no. But it, could it be a warranted assumption? Okay, so let's, let's differentiate between those two things. Remember I told you at the beginning that we were going to ask two questions. Are they necessary and are they warranted? Are they necessary and are they warranted? Speaking of philosophical naturalism and uniformitarianism. All right, with respect to uniformitarianism, is it necessary? No, I, I don't think it's necessary. I think a necessary axiom for science might be something like, you know, <laughs> I exist. Uh, the world around me exists. Um, the world around me is uniform. These are things that are necessary for science. But is uniformitarianism necessary for science? The idea that there could not have been a catastrophe so violent that it affected the rates, processes, and um, pressures, conditions, etc. of things as they happened on Earth. Uh, is it possible that something in the past is catastrophic enough to mess with the way that we observe these processes working today? And I think it is. I think it is. I certainly do think this from a creationist perspective. But you might be interested to know that there are um, those who come to this not only as uh, not young age creationists, but as atheists and even anti-creationists who don't hold to strict uniformitarianism. And I'm just going to mention two. Now, these guys are both deceased, but they were both big advocates for this. Um, Derek Ager and Stephen J. Gould. Uh, excuse me, Gould, more, more precisely. These guys were not uniformitarianists, but they were catastrophists. Now, th this certainly does not mean that they subscribe to flood geology. As a matter of fact, uh, Derek Ager is on record getting mad at creationists uh, for citing him. And so the only reason that I'm doing it uh, today is because I just want to point out, now these guys are talking about natural catastrophes, but I think that strengthens the point actually. Yes, we are talking about something supernatural, but these guys argued that this was possible even on a naturalistic level. So I want to use it. I want to use that to my advantage. I think we have people saying, very smart people, and Derek Ager, his, his book on this, I think it's called The New Catastrophism or something. They argued that this kind of large-scale process that is responsible for the formation of the way things are on the earth today could happen naturalistically. Now, if it could happen naturalistically, could it happen supernaturalistically? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't think anybody would dispute that. The question is, do we have um, reason to think that? Okay, so now I don't want to get too ahead of myself here. So is it a necessary assumption for science? No. No. No, it's not a necessary assumption for science. Let me give you another reason to think that it's not a necessary assumption for science. The scientific method, as developed by uh, Muslim scholars like Al Haytham back in the day, and passed up through guys like Rene Descartes, uh, and then uh, perfected pretty much into the form that we use today by Sir Isaac Newton, this method was developed and even perfected hundreds of years before the idea of uniformitarianism was even suggested, let alone accepted as the mainstream philosophy. So it's obvious to me that these scientists um, of days gone by understood that we could have uniformity of nature, but also understood that God could intervene in such ways uh, that could violate... Um, certain aspects that we are aware of concerning this uniformity. Now, so so based on that, no, I, I don't think that uniformitarianism is necessary in order to do science. It is not a necessary assumption. But now the question must be, is it a warranted assumption? Is it a warranted assumption? This is a tricky question because I think it could be. I think that if there were not a God, I think there would be every reason to think that uniformitarianism is true. Um, in, there is a sense in which uniformitarianism is an extension of the principle of uniformity. They are not the same thing. 
make no mistake, they say something different. Uniformity says that we have consistent laws that are consistent over time and space. Uniformitarianism says that present rates, conditions, and processes are the same as they have always been in the past. Okay, these are two different things. It is not a distinction without a difference. However, they are two very closely related concepts. Close enough related that I think, to be honest, we would have to admit that uh, if all we were dealing with was the scientific evidence, it could be a warranted assumption. However, so the question we have to ask is, is there other background information that we have that would lead us to think that maybe this uniformitarianism, this gradualism idea that teaches that large-scale catastrophic events have no part in explaining the present configuration on Earth, in other words, the present is the key to the past, is there any reason to think that that might not be a warranted philosophy? And it is a philosophy. Let's not forget that. Is that a warranted philosophy, a warranted assumption going into it? I think there are both biblical and scientific reasons to think that it's not. Now, the scientific reasons, and I'm going to mention them, but they are more specific to the project of geology. And again, this is because this is where uniformitarianism um, comes to bear. Okay, this is uniformitarianism. Uh, it speaks of uh, geology. It is a geology term. But don't forget that this idea, because it has close ties into the laws of physics, it is going to transcend and pervade into the other scientific um, endeavors. And so it's all mixed together. It all gets mixed together. Uh, when, we, when we take uniformitarian assumptions in one area, we must accept them in all the others. So is there a reason? Do we have warrant? to think that this is not an acceptable philosophy. I think we I think we do. Here's why. So first we have biblical reasons. We have biblical reasons. Now, when we are looking at the past, there is a legitimate project to understanding uh, events from a scientific perspective. Again, looking at the past. This is not something that should be shied away from. It is something that can be embraced. The difficulty with embracing that, though, is that past events are, by definition, in the past. You cannot repeat that exact event. You can maybe do events that are similar, uh, but you cannot repeat that event. You have to make certain inferences, and you also have to make certain assumptions. You cannot, you just cannot look back into the past and uh, observe things in the way that you can observe things in the present. These are two different kinds of things. And unfortunately, they will have to be based on certain assumptions that are um, not necessarily provable or unprovable, but they are more or less reasonable, possibly based on certain background information. For example, if the only background information that we had was, well, there is no God, if we didn't have anything like a Bible, if we didn't have Christians who believed that this Bible was the Word of God, then perhaps there would be a reason to think that uniformitarianism is true. But we do have a Bible. Now, this Bible is a record of history. This record of history gives us information about certain non-repeatable events in the past that happened. We have good reason to believe that what the Bible tells us about reality is true. Um, the closer that you get to our present time frame, obviously, the easier it is to verify the details. So then what you have to ask is, do you have some things in the Bible that are verified by multiple lines of evidence that would help testify to those earlier things that are um, held up by maybe less historical evidence? 
And so let me get specific on you. Something that every Christian, by definition, believes in is the death, burial, and resurrection of a man named Jesus Christ. In Matthew 19, in Matthew, I think it's chapter 23, maybe even Matthew 24, Jesus makes some statements in those particular chapters. I think maybe even Matthew 5, there's a little bit of this. Well, maybe not Matthew 5. Um, Certainly Mark 10, there's some of this. And what you have is this man named Jesus. In John 1, we learn that Jesus actually was there at the beginning of creation. And in these other chapters I just mentioned, we've got information from Jesus that seems to suggest that he believed details that stem back to some of the earliest moments of earth history. So what I'm trying to say is that we have reason to believe Jesus because he is our Savior, our Lord. He is God. He was there in the very beginning. And he affirms certain aspects uh, explicitly in the New Testament that speak to these, that that have great historical uh, veracity, that speak to these issues that have less maybe historical veracity um, and that are a little bit harder to get at because of their date uh, in terms of extra biblical information. Now, I do think the Bible itself is evidence. We have to take the Bible itself uh, for what it claims. But again, all I'm trying to say is that from a rational perspective, from an evidence perspective, we have more evidence than for the existence of Jesus um, than we have for the existence of Noah, okay, just for example. But Jesus affirmed the existence of Noah. So to me, this is concrete evidence, okay? So uh, we have that. So now we have a record of history that is verified by the person who was there from the beginning of world history, from the beginning of universe history, from the all time from alpha to omega from beginning to end who was and who is and who is to come okay we have a transcendent creator god who was there and in the person of jesus christ was manifest and affirmed some of these details now these details tell us some things about the history of the earth that lead us to think that we could question the philosophy of uniformitarianism because remember it's not necessary So then the only question is, is it warranted? And it might be warranted apart from background information. Remember, an assumption is reasonable or unreasonable based on certain other forms of background information. Okay, now exegesis of the text, here's the first biblical reason, gives us a global flood and supernatural invention, uh, intervention, excuse me, at particular points in history. Exegesis gives us a global flood and supernatural intervention at particular points in history. Um, Obviously, the two most obvious points there are the flood and the creation. Uh, I know there are many well-meaning folks, both in the young age creationist camp, the old age creationist camps, um, who attempt to view the creation of the universe from a very scientific lens, more and more, I am opting not to go with that line of thinking. I think it might be noble, but perhaps wrong-headed. I think that we can't treat the creation event as if it were some scientifically explainable thing. I think that at a certain point, it's time to own up to something that can't be naturalistically explained, that it is a supernatural event. And I'm okay saying that. Creation's only going to happen one time. It has only happened one time. It is a supernatural thing. And I don't think applying naturalistic processes to the creation of the world is going to get us anywhere. I just don't think that. And... Uh, I don't hold to the Big Bang. Uh, To be honest with you, some of the cosmological models that have been put out uh, by young age creationists, um, I don't necessarily hold to those. 
Uh, I find, uh, if anything, I find uh, Danny Faulkner's recent Dasha theory, um, or Dasha, I guess, more specifically, or more precisely, rather, uh, his theory uh, dealing with the miraculous translation uh, translation of light uh, from uh, to in order to deal with the distant starlight issue, and it speaks to a uh, uh, a supernatural kind of creation. I think this is probably one of the better suggestions that we've had because it really gives credence to the supernatural um, act of creation. And that's a little bit of a <laughs> of an excursus there, but the point I want to make is that we have this um, reason to believe in a supernatural origin to the universe. I think we also have reason to believe that we have a uh, global flood. Uh, we don't get this from preconceived ideas. We don't get this from wishful thinking or from a terrible mishandling of the text. I think we get the global flood interpretation from sound exegesis. And I've argued that uh, on my blog. Uh, there, um, There's an article on there that says, Does the Bible teach that... Um, I forget exactly how it's worded, but it's on the homepage. It's on the front page. Uh, does the Bible or does Scripture say the flood was global or local? Uh, something like that. So I've argued that from a scriptural perspective. Here on this podcast with an episode called A Flood of Evidence, I've argued it from a scientific perspective. I think we have good reason to think that there was a global flood. If there was indeed a global flood, it contradicts the assumption of uniformitarianism. Plain and simple. So this is background information we have from history that has been verified by a figure that we have uh, better, if you'll allow me to say that, um, I guess maybe I should say more complete historical information of four. And this particular conclusion leads us to say that there might be reason to question the uniformitarian assumption. Now, those who don't want to question the uniformitarian assumption instead reinterpret scripture to say that this was probably some sort of a local flood. Well, again, I've argued against that in that article on my blog that uh, maybe you'll go read, okay? Um, and I don't think that, that that helps us at all. And as a matter of fact, in that article, I gave yet another reason, uh, and that's the next reason that I'm going to tell you here uh, why we should question it, and that is that God promises the strict uniformity of nature. But he only does this the first time this appears, in other words, is after the flood. I invite you to go read Genesis 8.22, and I don't have the Bible in front of me here, or I would read it to you. But Genesis 8.22 speaks about this covenant that God has established. It's part, uh, I believe, of the Noahic covenant. And it talks about the fact that God's never going to flood this earth again. And he says, while the earth remains at seed time and harvest, cold and winter, these things are just going to continue. They're going to persist. Uh, this is the very first time that we have a promise from God that nature is going to be strictly uniform. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it comes directly after the flood. This is another reason, I think, to question uniformitarianism. Let me give you one final biblical reason. The Apostle Peter, under the inspiration, of course, of the Holy Spirit, warns us against such philosophies in 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7. I'm going to read it to you. Here it says this, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets, and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking in their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were, from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of godly men. Now, to me, this passage, there's a couple things going on here. 
And we're not going to give a, a complete exegesis of this passage because we don't have time. But notice what what things are in view. We have here in view, yes, the promise of his coming. But it's not just talking about the promise of his coming. It says, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, what's that talking about? For by this... For this, excuse me, they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Right? The creation. And then uh, verse 6, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The flood. And of course the heavens and earth, which are now, are kept in store. And they're reserved unto what? The final judgment. So we have these things. And I think what we have here is Peter warning us that... uh, there are going to be these people who come along, scoffers, the Bible calls them, and they're walking in their own lust, and they say there was no creation. There was no flood. And guess what? There's also not going to be any judgment. Oh, and by the way, the return of the Lord, yeah, you can forget that too, because he hasn't come back yet. So there's all of this going on here in this passage, and I have some who have tried to say that this is just talking about the return of Jesus. But for the life of me, I cannot read this passage and see that. That could be one of the main points. I think that is probably one of the main points of the passage. But what about all the supporting data? All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're ignorant of that. They're ignorant of the creation. They're ignorant of the flood. They're ignorant when it comes to these areas. And the Bible, even worse, says that they are willingly ignorant of those things, which is very disturbing. But this is just what the Bible tells us. So these are three, I think, biblical reasons that we should question the assumption of uniformitarianism. I certainly want to say that we want to affirm that nature is uniform because God keeps it that way. But God never promised us strict uniformity in nature. Now, it could be that there were laws of physics operating before the flood, the same as they are today, and that he just changed those during the flood and then put them back. I I don't know. I think that's outside of the realm of speculation. We don't have that. I, I, I mean, we just simply don't have that. I think we can only say what we have warrant to say from the Bible. What we have warrant to say from the Bible is that God did not promise the strict uniformity of nature until after the flood, which means that things were not operating, or at least it gives us warrant to think that things were not operating during the flood as the way they are today. And if that's the case, then we have no problem with questioning uniformity of nature or excuse me, with questioning uh, uniformitarianism. And I certainly think this is the case with respect to a supernatural creation. There's no reason to assert uniformitarianist philosophy onto the creation event. To me, that would be absurd. This is a supernatural event. And uniformitarianism is, by definition, naturalistic. So I really don't think there is any reason at all to think that this is warranted, given the biblical background information. Now, there's also scientific reasons, okay? We have rocks um, of recent age, known recent age, that happen to show long radiometric ages consistent with deep time. How can this possibly be? Uh, We have evidence of actual youth, in the rocks, uh, such as polonium halos uh, that have to do with uh, the flowing of water through these rocks in what looks to be a pretty short period of time, and yet they're giving radiometric dates that show deep time. How can this be? We have evidence of age, deep age, and evidence of actual youth. We have evidence of recent rock formations. I'm thinking um, Sertsy and um, the Mount St. Helens explosion. We have these things that look almost identical to the kinds of rocks, and sometimes, in some cases, even date that way, to those who have formed over millions of years, and yet they are recent formations. And, again, for more, <laughs> for even more reasons to question this, I, I do I do encourage you to go back and listen to our episode uh, that we recorded on a flood of evidence. There are, There is tons of evidence in the rocks that suggest uniformitarian philosophy should be questioned. So we have scientific reason to question it. We have biblical reason to question it. 
we can hold to the uniformity of nature without holding to uniformitarianism. And again, if we wanted to strip this back, I mean, to the simplest argument, I really think the argument from Genesis 8.22 takes the cake. We, we have a promise that does not come until some 2,000 years after the creation of the world that we will have the strict uniformity of nature. Now, if I was going to speculate, I would say that, yes, probably nature was uniform in a very similar way uh, to the way that nature is uniform today. Prior to that time. And that maybe God, um, simply as part of the judgment on the earth and the universe, altered the laws of physics. I think that's possible, but it's mere speculation. And I want to avoid being arbitrary. And I think the only way to avoid being arbitrary is to just say with confidence that we know that this was not a promise given until Genesis 8.22, which means that before that, it wasn't promised, which means it could have been different. And since we think that it needed to be different in order to posit a global flood, then we have warranted to think that that's the case. And when we don't assume uniformitarian assumptions, when we uh, follow the evidence that we have based on our catastrophist assumption, based on our historical record that we have that once again was verified by the man Christ Jesus himself, we have what we think is good evidence for a global flood. Good evidence that uniformitarian philosophy is incorrect. Is it necessary? No. Is it warranted? It could be but not with respect to the background information that we have. In the Bible, we have a record of history. And here's what I want to leave you with. We have every right to question philosophical assumptions which challenge that record. Whether we're talking about the resurrection of Christ, there are naturalistic philosophical assumptions that say the resurrections don't happen whether it be the virgin birth. There are naturalistic philosophical assumptions that say virgin births don't happen. There are naturalistic philosophical assumptions that say global floods don't happen. Each of these events requires some form of miraculous intervention by God, and we absolutely believe that's exactly what we've seen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for our confidence in your inspired word, beginning all the way back in the book of Genesis. We love you today, Father. We pray that you would help us as we aim to be a witness for you this next week, that you would uh, guide us in each and every conversation and encounter, that we would become more confident Christians, that we can more confidently challenge skeptics, who attempt to uh, raise up these arguments against the knowledge of you. Help us, Lord, to cast those down, to take every thought captive, Lord, and to answer each person with meekness and with fear, Lord, the reverence and respect that you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us this week here on the Steve Schramm Show, talking about the difference between uniformitarianism and the uniformity of nature. It's been a good time. I hope you learned a little something. Uh, Don't forget to uh, rate and review the show, Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store. And also, uh, don't forget to go to steveschramm.com slash defend. steveschramm.com slash defend, especially if you are a new listener. You can go there, get on our email list. We want to send you something. We want to send you a four-part course on how to defend your faith with confidence. All right. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.